Section 17 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 17. To Miss Willis at Gloucester. Bath, April 26th. My dearest companion, the pleasure I received from yours, which came to hand yesterday, is not to be expressed. Love and friendship are, without doubt, charming passions, which absence serves only to heighten and improve. Your kind present of the garnet bracelets I shall keep as carefully as I preserve my own life, and I beg you will accept, in return, my heart housewife, with the tortoise-shell memorandum book, as a trifling pledge of my unalterable affection. Bath is, to me, a new world. All is gaiety, good humour, and diversion. The eye is continually entertained with the splendour of dress and equipage, and the ear with the sound of coaches, chairs, and other carriages. The merry bells ring round, from morn till night. Then we are welcomed by the city waits in our own lodgings. We have music in the pump-room every morning, cotillons every afternoon in the rooms balls twice a week and concerts every other night besides private assemblies and parties without number as soon as we were settled in lodgings we were visited by the master of the ceremonies a pretty little gentleman so sweet so fine so civil and polite that in our country he might pass for the prince of wales then he talked so charmingly both in verse and prose that you would be delighted to hear him discourse for you must know he is a great writer, and has got five tragedies ready for the stage. He did us the favour to dine with us, by my uncle's invitation, and next day squired my aunt and me to every part of Bath, which, to be sure, is an earthly paradise. The square, the circus, and the parades put you in mind of the sumptuous palaces represented in prints and pictures, and the new buildings, such as Prince's Row, Harlequin's Row, Bladdard's Row, and twenty other rows look like so many enchanted castles raised on hanging terraces. At eight in the morning we go in dishable to the pump-room, which is crowded like a Welsh fair, and there you see the highest quality and the lowest tradesfolks, jostling each other without ceremony, hail fellow, well met. The noise of the music, playing at the gallery, the heat and flavour of such a crowd, and the hum and buzz of their conversation gave me the headache, and vertigo the first day but afterwards all these things became familiar and even agreeable right under the pump-room windows is the king's bath a huge cistern where you see the patients up to their necks in hot water the ladies wear jackets and petticoats of brown linen with chip hats in which they fix their handkerchiefs to wipe the sweat from their faces but truly whether it is owing to the steam that surrounds them or the heat of the water or the nature of the dress or to all these causes together, they look so flushed and so frightful that I always turn my eyes another way. My aunt, who says every person of fashion should make her appearance in the bath, as well as in the abbey church, contrived a cap with cherry-coloured ribbons to suit my complexion, and obliged Wynn to attend her yesterday morning in the water. But, really, her eyes were so red that they made mine water as I viewed her from the pump-room. And, as for poor Wynne, she wore a hat trimmed with blue, what betwixt her wan complexion and her fear she looked like the ghost of some pale maiden who had drowned herself for love when she came out of the bath she took asafoetida drops and was fluttered all the way so that we could hardly keep her from going into hysterics but her mistress says it will do her good and poor win curtsies with the tears in her eyes for my part i content myself with drinking about half a pint of the water every morning the pumper, with his wife and servant, attend within a bar, and the glasses, of different sizes, stand ranged in order before them, so you have nothing to do but to point at that which you choose, and it is filled immediately, hot and sparkling from the pump. It is the only hot water I could ever drink, without being sick. Far from having that effect, it is rather agreeable to the taste, grateful to the stomach, and reviving to the spirits. You cannot imagine what colourful cures it performs, my uncle began with it the other day, but he made wry faces in drinking, and I am afraid he will leave it off. 
the first day we came to bath he fell into a violent passion beat two blackamoors and i was afraid he would have fought with their master but the stranger proved a peaceable man to be sure the gout had got into his head as my aunt observed but i believe his passion drove it away for he has been remarkably well ever since it is a thousand pities he should ever be troubled with that ugly distemper for when he is free from pain he is the best-tempered man upon earth so gentle so generous so charitable that everybody loves him and so good to me in particular that i shall never be able to shew the deep sense i have of his tenderness and affection hard by the pump-room is a coffee-house for the ladies but my aunt says young girls are not admitted insomuch as the conversation turns upon politics scandal philosophy and other subjects above our capacity but we are allowed to accompany them to the booksellers shops which are charming places of resort where we read novels plays pamphlets and newspapers for so small a subscription as a crown a quarter and in these offices of intelligence as my brother calls them all the reports of the day and all the private transactions of the bath are first entered and discussed from the bookseller from the bookseller's shop we make a tour through the milliners and toymen and commonly stop at mr gill's the pastry cook to take a jelly a tart or a small basin of vermicelli there is moreover another place of entertainment on the other side of the water opposite to the grove to which the company cross over in a boat it is called spring garden a sweet retreat laid out in walks and ponds and parters of flowers and there is a long room for breakfasting and dancing as the situation is low and damp and the season has been remarkably wet my uncle won't suffer me to go thither lest i should catch cold but my aunt says it is all a vulgar prejudice and to be sure a great many gentlemen and ladies of ireland frequent the place without seeming to be the worse for it they say dancing at spring gardens when the air is moist is recommended to them as an excellent cure for the rheumatism i have been twice at the play where notwithstanding the excellence of the performers the gaiety of the company and the decorations of the theatre which are very fine i could not help reflecting with a sigh upon our poor homely representations at gloucester but this in confidence to my dear willis you know my heart and will excuse its weakness after all the great scenes of entertainment at bath are the two public rooms where the company meet alternately every evening they are spacious lofty and when lighted up appear very striking they are generally crowded with well-dressed people who drink tea in separate parties play at cards walk or sit and chat together just as they are disposed twice a week there is a ball the expense of which is defrayed by a voluntary subscription among the gentlemen and every subscriber has three tickets i was there friday last with my aunt under the care of my brother who is a subscriber and sir ulick mackilligut recommended his nephew captain o'donagan to me as a partner but jerry excused himself by saying i had got the headache and indeed it was really so though i can't imagine how he knew it the place was so hot and the smell so different from what we are used to in the country that i was quite feverish when we came away aunt says it is the effect of a vulgar constitution reared among woods and mountains and that as i become accustomed to genteel company it will wear off sir Alec was very complacent made her a great many high-flown compliments and when we retired handed her with great ceremony to her chair the captain i believe would have done me the same favour but my brother seeing him advance took me under his arm and wished him good-night the captain is a pretty man to be sure tall and straight and well made with light grey eyes and a roman nose but there is a certain boldness in his look and manner that puts one out of countenance but i am afraid i have put you out of all patience with this long unconnected scrawl which i shall therefore conclude with assuring you that neither bath nor london nor all the diversions of life shall ever be able to efface the idea of my dear letty from the heart of her ever affectionate lydia melford End of section 17